By the end of this video, you'll know how to create a dynamic one-board birdhouse in Fusion 360. Hey there, it's Kevin Kennedy and welcome to this beginner Fusion 360 tutorial. I'll be referencing some different images and resources in this tutorial. So to find them, head to my website at productdesignonline.com forward slash one. That's productdesignonline.com forward slash one. And that will automatically redirect to the page with the resources for this tutorial. Before we dive right in, I want to take a moment to talk about the main goal of this tutorial. If you're looking to use Fusion 360 for woodworking projects, then this is definitely the video for you. I'll be showing you how to set up user parameters so you can set up your model to automatically adapt if you decide to change board types or dimensions of your project. If you're not planning on doing any woodworking related projects, you'll want to stick around anyway because I can assure you, you'll still learn a thing or two that can be useful in your own projects. I'll also be sharing a few tricks that I like to use to be more efficient when setting up dynamic models. To get started, I'm going to first make sure that my document settings are set to inches. I generally like to use millimeters, but I'm going to use the standard board dimensions, and I'm in the United States, so we're going to use the standard dimensions from Imperial Lumber. To change your dimensions, simply toggle open the document settings folder, which is located in your Fusion 360 browser on the left hand side. I'll click the Change Active Units icon. Then, I'll select Inches from the drop down list, and I'll click OK to confirm the change. Lastly, I'm just going to close the Document Settings toggle, as this browser list will get quite long as we start to create the different parts of the birdhouse. I'm going to click the Save icon at the top of the toolbar. Then, I'll type out One Board Birdhouse for the name, followed by clicking that blue Save button to save the file. Let's now start building out the birdhouse model. I'm going to use the first two images that you can reference on my website. In general, if you're working on a new woodworking project, you probably won't have a polished diagram with all your dimensions laid out. So here's my first tip. I always recommend sketching out your design on some scratch paper where you can write down at least some of the rough dimensions before you even touch Fusion 360. Now don't worry, you can always change your dimensions later on. However, having a general idea of your design will really help you set up the user parameters at the beginning, which I highly recommend as you'll save a ton of time. Looking at the cutting diagram image, You'll see that I've laid out all the different pieces of this birdhouse, so it's easier to visualize the types of dimensions we're actually working with. I'll select the Modify drop-down list. Then, you'll find the Change Parameters option near the bottom of the list. I'm going to click on the Settings or Three Dots icon just to the right of the name, and then I'll select the Pin to Toolbar option which places this in the toolbar above so we can quickly access our parameters as we work on the model. Then, I'll click on the Change Parameters option to open it up. You'll see this opens a large modal or dialog box in which we can set the value of parameters. You can think of these user parameters as variables where we set a reusable name equal to an integer or the dimensions of our model that of course we can change at any time. To create new parameters, you'll need to click the plus symbol next to the user parameters heading. Then, we'll simply need to fill out all the details. For the first parameter, we'll create the width of the board. I'll type out width for the name. Then, I'll type out 5.5 for the expression you'll see that the units of measurement default to the document settings, so I'll leave this set to inches. 
However, it's important to note that you can set this unit value to any of the other options as well. The name and expression are the only requirements. However, you'll also see that you can also type out a comment if you want to write a relevant note. For example, I may want to type something out such as width of the board. This could be super helpful if I share this file with someone else or if I plan on looking at my parameters later on down the road. With all of these fields filled out, I'll click the blue OK button. As I mentioned a little bit ago, I recommend having a rough idea of your dimensions as I find it's best to just go ahead and add all the parameters at the very beginning, knowing that we can always add additional parameters later on down the road. I'm going to click the plus symbol once again, and this time I'm going to add the height. If you look at the reference images, you'll see that the height of the sidewalls are 5.25 inches. I'll type out height for the name, 5.25 for the expression, and I'll type out height of sidewalls for the comment. Then I'll click the blue OK button. Next, I'll add the parameter for the thickness of the board. I'll simply title this one thickness. The thickness of the board is 0.75 or 3 quarters of an inch, and I'll type out a note of thickness of the board before clicking the blue OK button. Next, I'll add a parameter for the total height from the bottom of the house to the peak of the roof. I'll title this one total height, and I'll type out 8 inches for the expression followed by the comment of height from bottom to peak for the comment section. Then I'll click the blue OK button. Next, I'll add a parameter for the length of the roof. I'll title this one roof length, and then I'll type out an expression of nine inches. I'll type out a comment of length of the roof, and then I'll click the blue OK button. Now the last two parameters I'll add are for the wooden dowel rod that sticks out of the front of the birdhouse. The first of the two will be titled dowel length. And it will have an expression of two inches. I'll add a comment of length of the dowel rod. And then I'll click the blue OK button. Finally, I'll add the final parameter for this model that is the width of the dowel rod. I'll name this one dowel width, and I'll make the expression 0.5 inches. I'll type out width of dowel rod in the comment section, and then I'll click the blue OK button. Looking at the reference images, you'll see that there are a few dimensions that I left out, and that's intentional. Some of these dimensions we'll create using some simple equations with our variables. For example, for the narrow roof panel, we'll take the width parameter and we'll subtract the thickness parameter. For now, I'll click the OK button so we can start creating the components. The next time-saving tip to share with you, and something I like to do when I've planned ahead, I like to create a bunch of components and then name them all at once. I found that this just saves a little bit of time instead of having to create a new component each time we create a new part. If you're brand new to Fusion 360, then I'll just quickly point out the reason we're creating components is that it will group all the relevant sketches, bodies, and reference info, and we can also then duplicate, add joints, and have more control over the model than if all our pieces of the model were created with single bodies. I'm going to right click on the file name in the Fusion 360 browser. Then I'll select the new component option. Then I'm going to repeat this process five more times. As we have eight components or parts of the birdhouse, if you look at the cutting diagram while including the dowel rod. However, 
I'm only creating six total as we'll mirror a few of the components later on. Once all six components have been created, we'll want to rename them so we know what each individual part is. To rename a component, simply click on the component once to select it. Pause for just a second and then click on the name area, which lets you type directly in the input field. I'll name the first component front. I'm going to skip the back part of the birdhouse for now as we'll end up mirroring that component. Therefore, for the second one, I'll name it right side. We'll also mirror the left side of the house, so we only need the right side for now. I'll rename the third component bottom. I'll rename the fourth component narrow roof. I'll rename the fifth component wide roof. Lastly, I'll rename the sixth component Dow Rod. Alrighty, so we now have done the prep work for the model. So no matter what type of model you're building in Fusion 360, if you plan ahead and have your parts mapped out, I think you'll find creating the parameters and the components at the beginning will save you a little bit of time as you actually get started on modeling. To start on the model, we'll want to activate the front component as we'll draw the front of the birdhouse. Simply click the Activate Component button to the right of the front component name. Then, I'm simply going to select the Two Point Rectangle tool from the toolbar. This prompts us to choose one of the origin planes as we need a surface to create this two dimensional sketch on. I'll simply select the XZ plane which corresponds to the front face of the view cube in the upper right hand corner. Then I'll simply click on the origin point and I'll drag out with my mouse. This is where we get to start calling our user parameters instead of typing out individual dimensions. For the width of this rectangle, I'll start to type out the word width. And you'll see that the parameter suggestion comes up. I'll simply select the width parameter, and then I'll hit the tab key to switch to the other input field. For the height, we'll call the total height user parameter. As I type that out, I'll simply select it from the list of available parameters. Finally, I'll click to set the rectangle in place. Real quick, I just want to point out that you'll see the dimensions have the letters FX in front of them which is short for function. This is simply a way to let you know that the dimension is driven by a parameter or a function that you typed into the dimension input field. Next, we'll want to create the pitch of the roof. I'm going to activate the line command by hitting the keyboard shortcut letter L as in Lima. Then I'll click at the top of the rectangle in the middle of the line where the midpoint triangle constraint icon appears. And I'm simply going to click on the left side of the rectangle where the line snaps into place. With the line command still active, I'll click at the midpoint once again, and this time I'll select the right side of the rectangle. We're now going to dimension the distance from the bottom of the model to the intersection point of the lines that we just created. I'll activate the dimension tool with the keyboard shortcut letter D as in Delta. I'll simply click on the bottom left corner of the rectangle, and then I'll click on the intersecting point and I'll drag out with my mouse. I'm going to type out the parameter of height, as we want this to match the same height as our sidewalls of the birdhouse. Of course, I'll also do the same for the right hand side. Before moving on, I want to point out one thing that we just did with this sketch. If I toggle open the front component in the Fusion 360 browser, and then toggle open the Sketches folder, you'll notice that our sketch has a red thumbtack next to it. Now this red thumbtack means that our sketch is fully constrained. This means that our sketch cannot be moved or altered unless we change its dimensions or its constraints. 
and this is key when trying to create dynamic models. This is the only way to ensure that parts of your model won't slide or move around as you change dimensions later on. Now that we have the front shape done, let's turn this 2D sketch into a three-dimensional object. I'll select the extrude command in the toolbar. Then I'll simply select the house profile shape in the canvas window. For the extrude distance, we're going to use the thickness parameter, which if you remember at the beginning, we set to be the thickness of the board. I'll type out thickness in the input field, and then I'll click the OK button to confirm the results. We're now going to create the right sidewall of the birdhouse. First, we'll want to activate the right side component. I'll right click on the component name and then I'll select Activate, which is at the top of the list. You'll see as we work with various components, the components that aren't active have a lower opacity, making it easier to focus on the active component. Once again, I'm going to select the two point rectangle from the toolbar. Then I'll use the view cube to look at the back of the front board so I can select the back of the board as the plane to sketch on. I'm doing this because I'm going to build all these parts or components in place as I'll show you a trick at the end of this video which will save you a ton of time from having to add joints to each and every part. I'll click on the bottom left hand corner, then I'll drag out with my mouse cursor. I'm going to type out the thickness parameter for the width of the rectangle, as once again, this is the same as the thickness of the board. Then for the height of this rectangle, I'll type out the height parameter, followed by clicking to set the rectangle in place. Next, I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter E as in echo to activate the extrude command. Then I'll select the rectangle profile. If you look at the reference images, you'll see that this distance is the same as our board width. Therefore, I'll type out width in order to select the width parameter that we set up. Lastly, I'll click the OK button in the dialog box to confirm the results. We now have successfully created the front of the house and one of its sides. If you look at the birdhouse design, you'll notice that it has some symmetry. Therefore, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to mirror both the sidewall and the front of the house, which will save us time while keeping our model dynamic. In order to use the mirror command, we'll need a plane to reference as the mirror line. There are a number of different items that you could reference in this scenario. However, I personally like to use midplane construction planes because they're adaptable should other parts of the model change. I'll select the Construct drop down list, then, I'll select the midplane option. I'm going to click on the left and right sides of the front of the house. And as you'll see, that creates a plane directly in the middle. And this plane will stay in the middle even if we update the width of the front board. This looks correct, so I'll click the OK button. Now I'll select the mirror command from the Create drop-down list. I'll set the pattern type to Components, which lets us select the entire component to mirror. I'll go ahead and select the sidewall component. Next, I'll select the mirror line selector, and I'll select the construction plane that I just created. You'll see Fusion 360 gives us a nice preview of the mirror to help ensure everything is correct. It looks good to me, so I'll click the OK button. You'll see we now have a mirror component at the bottom of the list. I'll change the name to left side so I don't get confused looking at this component later on. I'll now repeat these steps for the front of the house. First, I'm going to activate the front component by clicking the Activate Component icon. 
Then I'll hide the front of the house and the construction plane that I just created. I'll simply click on the construction plane and then I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter V as in Victor, which activates the view slash hide command. I'll do the same thing for the front of the house as well, so I'm able to click on the side walls. At this point, I'll need to once again activate the midplane tool. I'm going to hit the keyboard shortcut letter S as in Sierra to activate the shortcuts box. I'll then type out midplane and I'll select the option from the list. Now this shortcuts box can really speed up your workflow and in all honesty, I use it like 95% of the time over using the toolbar or the dropdown list. However, I try to use the toolbar and dropdown list in these beginner lessons so it's easier for you to follow along and understand what's going on. For this midplane, I'll select each side of the right side component. Then I'll click the OK button to confirm the results. Next, I'll have to toggle open the bodies folder that is nested under the front component. I'll simply click the light bulb icon to turn its visibility back on as we're now ready to use it. I'll select the mirror command from the create dropdown list. You'll then see the pattern type defaults to the component option since we used that last. I'll then select the front component and I'll select the midplane as the mirror line. Everything looks correct, so I'll click the OK button. You'll see we now once again have a mirror component at the bottom of our list. I'll go ahead and change the name to back. We now have the walls of our house, so let's create the floor or bottom of the house. I'll activate the bottom component by selecting the activate component button next to its name. I'll select the two point rectangle tool in the toolbar, and I'll use the view cube to look at the bottom of the model. I'm going to select the bottom surface of the side wall. Next, I'll select the lower left hand corner and drag out with my mouse cursor. If you look at the reference image, you'll notice our bottom board is the smallest of all the boards. Our width of the bottom is actually the width of the board minus this thickness of both side walls. Fortunately for us, we can type out equations directly in these input fields. I'll type out width and select that parameter. Then I'll type out the minus symbol followed by the number two, the asterisk or time symbol, and then I'll type out the thickness parameter. Then I'll hit the tab key to lock that into place and to switch to the other input field. If you look at the width, you'll see that by typing out that equation, we've got exactly the width of this gap for the bottom board. And this will ensure that if we change the width or thickness of the board, that our bottom board will always fill the entire bottom gap. Now don't worry, we'll take a look at this by changing parameters after we've put the roof on the house. For the height of this rectangle, we'll use the width parameter as this should match the width of our sidewall, which is equal to the width of our board. After selecting the parameter, I'll click to set the rectangle in place. Then I'll activate the extrude command from the toolbar. I'll select the rectangle and I'll type out the thickness parameter in the distance input field. Now, if yours is running in the wrong direction, then you'll simply need to add a minus sign in front of the thickness parameter to change the direction. Then I'll click the OK button to confirm the results. Before moving on, I'm going to right click on the construction plane and I'll select the view hide option to hide it from our view. We're now ready to add the roof to the birdhouse then we'll finish it off by creating the hole in the dowel rod. I'll first activate the narrow roof component. 
I'll select the two-point rectangle from the toolbar. Then, I'll select the pitch of the roof as the plane to draw on. I'm going to just click to the left of the house where the line snaps in parallel to the top of the roof. Then, I'll type out another equation as our narrow roof is the width of the board minus the thickness since the other roof board overlaps this one. I'll type out width and select that parameter, the minus sign, and then the thickness parameter. I'm going to then hit the tab key in order to type out the roof length parameter. Finally, I'll click with my mouse to set the rectangle in place. As I mentioned earlier, you'll want to ensure that your sketches are fully constrained. You'll see that right now our rectangle is not only not lined up correctly, but I can actually move it around freely. To fix this, we'll need to create a construction line that we'll use to add a midpoint constraint. I'll select the line tool from the toolbar. Then I'll select the construction option in the sketch palette as you'll want to create construction lines anytime you're creating sketch geometry just for reference purposes. I'm going to draw a line from the top left corner to the top right corner. Then I'll hit the escape key. You'll see the construction line is distinguished by being a dashed line. I'll now hold down the shift key on my keyboard and I'll select the construction line and I'll select the top line of the rectangle. I'll then select the midpoint constraint icon in the sketch palette, which is the triangle. Now this forces our rectangle to snap into the same center point of our construction line, ensuring that our roof is always centered. Once again, if you look at the sketch that's nested underneath this component, you'll see that we have a fully constrained sketch as signified by the red thumbtack icon. Therefore, I'll activate the extrude command and I'll select both profiles. I'll type out the thickness parameter and then I'll click the OK button. We'll now need to repeat similar steps to create the other side of the roof. I'll activate the wide roof component, then I'll activate the two point rectangle command and then select the pitch of the house to sketch on. For this rectangle, I'm going to start out by clicking on the upper left hand corner of the other part of the roof. Then for the width, I'll use the roof length parameter. And because this side of the roof is the full width, I'll type out the width parameter for the other input field. After clicking to set the rectangle in place, I'll activate the extrude command. And once again, I'll select both profiles. Followed by the thickness parameter. Then I'll click the OK button to confirm the results. To view this entire model with normal opacity, I'll simply right click on the top level assembly in the Fusion 360 browser and I'll click Activate. We now need to create the hole on the front of the birdhouse as well as the dowel rod just below it. I'll activate the front component so we're working with just that. Then I'm going to activate the line command from the toolbar. Once again, I'll turn on the construction option and I'm going to click at the midpoint of the bottom of the house. I'm going to make this construction line a reference line that we'll use to create the hole from. In order to make this dynamic as well, I'm going to type out the total height parameter followed by the division or forward slash symbol and then the number two. This will ensure the hole on the front of the house is always in the middle, even if we update the height of the house. I'll click to set the line in place. Then I'm going to turn off the construction option by selecting it in the sketch palette. I'll activate the center circle command with the keyboard shortcut letter C as in Charlie, and I'll click on the endpoint of the line. 
Then I'm going to type out with forward slash three to make the whole always one third of the house's width. I'll activate the extrude command. I'll select the circle. I'll type out the minus symbol and then I'll plug in the thickness parameter in the distance input field. Then I'll change the operation to the cut option to ensure that this hole is cut all the way through even if the board thickness changes. Lastly, I'll click the OK button to confirm the results. We'll now create a hole for the dowel rod. I'll follow similar steps as we did for the previous hole. I'm going to activate the line command from the toolbar. Once again, I'll turn on the construction option and I'm going to click at the midpoint of the bottom of the house. Then I'll make this distance the total height parameter divided by the number four. Then I'm going to turn off the construction option in the sketch palette. Once again, I'll activate the center circle command with the keyboard shortcut letter C as in Charlie. I'll click on the endpoint of the line. Then I'm going to type out the dowel width parameter. After activating the extrude command, I'll make this minus thickness parameter as well, ensuring it cuts all the way through. Then I'll click the OK button. Now to create the dowel rod, we'll first need to activate the dowel rod component. Then we're going to reference the circle cutout that we just created. To do so, I'm going to hide the back component by selecting its corresponding light bulb in the Fusion 360 browser. I'm going to then use the view cube to look at the back of the model so I can select the back side of the whole cutout. Then I'm going to head to the sketch dropdown list. I'll find the project forward slash include folder and I'll select the project option. Then I'll select the back surface of the front of the house. This project tool essentially lets us reuse the circle cutout geometry. Once we click the OK button, you'll see that I can select the circle and hit the extrude button. The project command saved us a few steps from having to sketch out the circle and where we want it to be placed. And because the circle was projected, the circle's geometry will be driven by the size of the hole cut out. I can now use the dowel length user parameter, and if it's heading in the wrong direction, I can once again use the minus symbol in front of the parameter name. Finally, I'll click the OK button to confirm the results. To take a look at the model in its entirety, I'll turn the back component back on by selecting its corresponding light bulb. Then I'll right click on the top level component or the file name and I'll select Activate. Before we take a look at how our model responds when we change the values of any user parameter, let's go ahead and add the appearance of wood. I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter A as in alpha to activate the appearance dialog. Then I'll simply search pine in the search field. I'm going to drag and drop the first pine option onto the dowel rod. Next, I'll take the stained light semi-gloss pine option, which you'll have to download if you haven't already, and I'm going to drag this over to one of the boards. You'll notice that it just applied the appearance to one board. If you'd like to apply the appearance to all the boards at once, then you can drag the appearance to the top level component in the Fusion 360 browser. You'll get the warning message in which I'll hit the keep button to keep the appearance of the dowel rod since I want that to be unique. I'll close out the appearance dialog and now you'll see that we have a fairly realistic birdhouse that could be created with one single six foot board. Before we change any of the parameters, I want to first show you a quick technique to apply joints to this model as I promised earlier on in this tutorial. 
As of now, if I click and drag on one of the components, you'll see it can be moved around freely. I'll go ahead and click the undo button to revert the change. First, we'll need to ground one of the components. You can think of this as the base of the model. I like to use the component that touches the ground or bottom surface plane. However, you aren't required to do so. I'll simply right click on the bottom component in the Fusion 360 browser. Then I'll select the ground option from the list, which is near the top of the list. You'll see this adds a red thumbtack to the component name, which lets you know that it has been grounded. Now the grounded feature has also been added to the timeline below. Next, we need to add rigid joints to all of the remaining components. Now in some scenarios, we would have to add rigid joints one by one. However, because we built these components in place, we're able to add all the joints at the same time. I'll simply click and drag my mouse cursor over the entire model to select everything. Then I'll select the Assemble drop down list in order to select the Rigid Group option. I'll click OK to confirm the selection. Now you'll see as I try and click and drag on each component that it will not move anywhere. And we no longer have to worry about parts of the birdhouse being moved out of position. Last but not least, let's take a look at what happens when we update our user parameters. I'll click the user parameters icon in the toolbar, and I'm just going to drag the dialog down so you can see what's going on here. To update a parameter, all we have to do is change its expression. Let's see what happens when we change the thickness of the board. Maybe we want to use a half inch board instead of a three quarter inch board. I'll delete this 7, and then I'll hit the Enter key on my keyboard. Notice how the model updates accordingly. As I move the model around, you'll see that all the boards have been updated and our house is still intact. Maybe I decided I want the roof length to be 8 inches. As I change that expression, you'll see the model updates accordingly. I can change the dowel width to 0.75 inches and the dowel length to 2.5 inches. Let's see what happens when I change the width expression from 5.5 inches to 6.5 inches. You'll see that the roof gets a little bit messed up, and that's because the pitch of our roof is not defined in a dynamic way. Now the great thing about user parameters and dimensions in Fusion 360 is the fact that we can go back and add them or alter them at any time. To fix this, I'm going to change the width back to 5.5 inches, and I'll close out the user parameters box. Then I'm going to activate the front component. Next, I'll double click on the first sketch so we can edit the dimensions. If you take a look at the reference images, you'll see that the distance here, which we currently have set to the height, could also be set as the total height parameter minus the width parameter divided by two. Once I click the Enter key, it will appear that nothing changed, but we've actually just made this model even more dynamic. I'll go ahead and copy and paste this function into the other dimension so we can take a look at the change. I'll stop the sketch and reactivate the top level component. Then I'll open the user parameters dialog. This time, watch what happens when I change the width from 5.5 to 6.5 inches. Now you'll see that the roof of the house is no longer messed up because the pitch of the roof also updates accordingly. Of course, if you want to revert the dimensions back to the originals that we plugged in, you can either hit the undo button a few times, or you can simply edit the expressions in the user parameters dialog box. I should also point out that obviously to some degree, this model is not 100% dynamic. 
If I were to change the total height parameter to 4 inches, you'll see that the model is really messed up. But of course, it's just unrealistic to have this at 4 inches high and still include the hole in the dowel rod and roof with their respective sizes. You could, however, update all the parameters to completely scale the model while keeping it intact. In summary, you'll find that as you plan ahead, you'll be able to create dynamic models that are easily updated when you decide you need to change the material or board types. I always recommend starting out by sketching your design to at least figure out some of the rough dimensions before you even touch Fusion 360. If you made it to the end of this video, then let me know by commenting below whether or not you like these longer format tutorials. This will help me decide whether I should stick with them or if I should go back to the shorter 15 minute tutorials. As always, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this tutorial. If you've enjoyed this tutorial, please click that thumbs up icon and click on that playlist in the lower right hand corner to watch more woodworking related tutorials. To join the Product Design Online community, be sure to click that red subscribe button and click that little bell icon to be notified of more Fusion 360 tutorials.